And you're welcome to the RT Rugby Podcast as Leinster and Ulster take their place in the Pro 14 final this weekend. How worried should Munster fans be? And it looks like Owen Farrell's fondness for close lining opposition players has finally caught up. And I'm delighted to be joined by Donald Lennon, Bernard Jackman and Wes Liddy. Gentlemen, you're all very welcome. Uh, Donald, I guess if uh, before we get into the uh, matters last weekend, this weekend, if Leo Cullen was looking for an early Christmas present, he's been handed it. Owen Farrell now missing for the only game Saracens have cared about since they were relegated to the English Second Division. Yeah, it's an incredible turn of events, Hugh. As you say, Saracens have been focused on this quarter final. I think, uh, you know, for the last five or six months, uh, they've been chopping and changing their team in the in the Gallagher Premiership at the moment, which, of course, is meaningless for them because they've already been relegated about five months ago. Uh, so all roads were leading to Dublin. And uh, but that said, um, you know, Owen Farrell, it was only a matter of time before he was going to get in serious trouble over a high tackle. I, I was looking there... Apparently, he's had eight yellow cards in his career for Saracens. Seven of them have been for high tackles. So, uh, you know, this was an accident waiting to happen. Uh, it looked a dreadful tackle, I have to say. And, um, you know, there was no question he was going to be suspended. It was only a matter of time for how long. Uh, that has been announced now today. He's out, I think, for five weeks. So, um, he's out of the, the quarterfinal. And that, you know, this it's still this is going to be it's not going to be a straightforward game for, for Leinster, but for Saracens to be without their key man at number ten is huge. Yeah. Any truth in the rumor that Owen Farrell learned his tackle technique down at the cookies in Young Munster Wes, or, or <laughs> can you confirm that? No, no, there's I don't think there's any truth in that rumor. Um Right, right. Five games, yeah. <laughs> Can't really argue with it, I don't think. You, you can't. <laughs> I mean look, he's been asking for this, like he's been asking for this, you know. He has got away with an awful lot of suspect hits. We think about it, even in the World Cup as well against South Africa last year in November Test Series. And this was as blatant as you're going to get. Um, you know, doesn't seem like a bad guy. I've heard, but he, obviously he's captain and all that kind of stuff. But he just tends to lash out in these kind of situations and go for the high tackles. Yeah, yeah look, I think uh, I, I was watching a bit of the game. He, um, you know, he was having a sort of a frustrating start. He'd missed a few kicks to touch. And he does get a bit of red mist every now and then if things don't go his way. We have seen it before. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any badness or maliciousness in him. He's a, the ultimate competitor. He, uh, you know, he's a guy you love to have in your team. But, uh, you know, I think the, the recipient was an 18-year-old uh, just out of school. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't a great ad for the game. But that said, look, I mean, he put his hands up. He knew immediately he had done wrong. Uh, it's just that split second, as I say, when the red mist comes down and you lose control. But a player of his experience, quality, given his role as a captain and that, he just needs to to exert some more self-control. And uh, it's cost the club uh, very dearly now because, um, you know, he is such a key element of that uh, Saracen side. He's a huge loss going to Dublin. But yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm you that um, it's, um, it's him and Abraham Papalia tackle is good examples in the framework of where the tackler has a clear line of sight and has time to adjust his body position. You know, it's, it's a, there's a mitigating circumstance where if he is blindsided, they can reduce the sanction. But for that Farrell tackle and for the, the, the one in the Connacht match, um, it's with both players have a clear line of sight on the player. And that's what World Rugby are trying to do to bring, to change the culture of how you approach a tackle and to show people you have to come maybe a foot below to, to mitigate yeah. for a guy dipping at the last minute. Yeah, yeah but that Papa, that 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 Papa Leo one and the 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 Connor game. Um, I mean, it was on Connor Murray. Connor Murray is about six foot two. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So uh, and yeah, he was Charlie upright. Atkinson is half his size. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, so there was no and mitigating circumstance in either of them. Uh, you're right, Mike. But uh, which was a pity because that uh, that Papa Leo game. I was doing that game in RT Radio, and he had a fantastic opening twenty minutes. He looks a really good acquisition for Connacht. Um, but look, was it fortunate? Uh, he'll serve his suspension, I've no doubt. But uh, he looks an interesting signing for Connacht. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's go back to last weekend, if we can, uh, as we start with Leinster against Munster. Uh, Wes, just to get your thoughts on this, there's a lot of doom and gloom this week about uh, about Munster. You know, Van Graan is getting a lot of stick uh, on social media sites um, for his perceived lack of ideals or indeed how far has he actually brought the team on since he came in. Is that fair, do you think? I mean, would you be as pessimistic after their performance against Leinster? Um, yeah, I think it probably is fair. Um, I think, like, you, you can look at it and say, 
um, you know, there was a dubious enough try awarded and there was a kicker who was given the golden boot that day, kicking 90% over the season that doesn't kick even 30% on the night in a 13-3 game and say, well, you know, take those opportunities, it's a different story. But in reality, that doesn't tell the story of the game and that Leinster were utterly in control for large parts of it. Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's the manner of the defeat and, and re-emphasising that, that kind of inability to offer something in attack against the best teams and big games. But it was even more uh, stayed an approach than, than in previous games we've seen. And and for me, it's it's a couple of things. It's, it's, it's this current team um, and, and where they can go. It's also now you know, 12 years since the European Cup and nine since a Pro 14. <clears throat> and that kind of uh, inability to, 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 to go past the semi-final stage isn't just uh, reflective. It'd be foolish to think it's just reflective of what's happening with this bunch of senior players right now. There's obviously wider um, organisational questions that need to be asked, I'm sure are being asked, in terms of the quality of player you're hoping to bring through over the next 10 years and the, the quantity of them also, especially in comparison to some others. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to get too stuck into, uh, Donald, the, the nitty-gritty of the match itself because we're midway through the week now and we're kind of looking towards next weekend. But I, just, I guess, the, the larger question around Munster now, and, and, and as Wes has just said, it does seem to be a question on, on where Munster are you know, as, as a stronghold in Europe rugby. And again, you know, you look at the record in the Champions Cup of the last few years, you can, you can point to semi-finals, you can point to 14. As well as mentioned there, it's been a long time since Munster lifted a trophy of any calibre. And that has to be a concern. Yeah, of course it's a concern. I mean, they're getting to the, the penultimate stage of all these competitions and they can't get over the line. I think it's mental now as much as anything else. I think they've lost 10 semi-finals in nine years, which is... Uh, uh, and when you consider there's a cohort of your leaders have been with that team right through that period, then uh, I think it's, it's mental as well as everything else. I mean, the, the glass half full person will say, when you look at the Munster squad as they're uh, currently constructed, uh, you know, with a, a Fitz Neyman, Dialande, Joey Carberry, they are a serious, serious outfit. But there is no team, and you know, it's bad luck, it's whatever you like to call it. I mean, to lose a fellow of Snyman's quality seven minutes into his, his debut is... Uh, hugely unlucky but there's no squad playing rugby in the professional era that has the capacity to pick uh, from a full deck you see Leinster I mean so much was made Dave Kilcoyne was missing Snyman was missing Leinster were without uh, Ty Furlong they were without James Ryan and they've Dan Levy ready to, to come back hopefully in the next couple of weeks so you've got to be able to get over those issues the thing for me Really, I, I found our performance quite depressing in a way because uh, I was at both games, so I was lucky to be one of the, the, the 200 or whatever numbers were allowed into the Aviva. Uh, the, the, the first game, we had no right to expect anything. And, uh, you know, number one, it was a cracking game, the, the, the original Pro 14 match. Secondly, Munster, um, the variety of Munster's game was far better. If I was to criticise them, I would say... They waited almost till the final quarter when they were chasing the game before they uh, put a bit more width on their game and the variety that you'd expect of a backline that's been coached by Stephen Larkham. They ended up, they scored three tries, all three by their wingers, Conway two, Keith Earls one. Yet, you get into the semi-final and it's almost as if, um, you know, they just close everything down. I mean, so much has been made of, of the kicking game, which is uh, like... It isn't as if Leinster didn't know what was coming, but I think there are bigger issues. They had nine set pieces in the Leinster 22, yet all they had to show was three points, which was scored in the first five minutes of the game. Um, so there are all kinds of issues. The personnel, uh, they have the personnel, but you've got to maximise the quality that you have. And the biggest issue for me, and that, bit, that is a, a reflection on coaching, is that you don't maximise the talent that you have. And I think that's where Munster are at the moment, accepting that Leinster are a step ahead of, of most other sides in Europe. So there's no shame in losing to Leinster, just the manner in which you lose is the biggest concern. What did you make of them, Bernard? Yeah, look, I can understand why they set up to play that way, particularly at the start. 
Um, they had some success with, with kicking contestables in the, in the previous game. But, um, and also the short turnaround, so maybe didn't have time to work on a plan B. But at half time, you know, when it was obvious that Leinster had worked on her kick escort, um, you know, Larmer was having a, a pretty secure game. Hugo, Hugo Keenan had come in um, and, you know, was, was quite assured in that area that there wasn't a plan B or, a, you know, it seemed as if when Delande got choked early on by, by Sexton um, and held up, it was like, well, we don't, can't go to the back line either. But I, I think they're underestimating or, or they're underestimating Farrell's and Delande's ability to be distributors as well and get the ball into, into the likes of Daly's hands, who has looked sharp, definitely Conway and Earls. And that was the biggest regret for them. That was only really the last five or six minutes when they seemed to up the ante and, you know, maybe could have scored a, a consolation try, but very poor from them. And, and I suppose from Leinster's point of view, they just, they got a lead. Um, and then, you know, there was knockout rugby and they were, weren't willing to take any risks. So Munster probably hoped the Leinster would overplay uh, coming back from those contestables and that might give them a chance. But Leinster were pretty clinical in terms of their game management without ever hitting, without ever playing well, which is obviously even more frustrating for, for, um, for Munster is that Leinster didn't have to be at their best to, to beat them. Whereas, as Donald said, the first round... Uh, it was a feeling that Munster put it up to him and asked questions of them, and uh, they'll definitely have massive regrets around the way they they didn't didn't fire at all. And some of that was down to the tactics, but also, yeah, I just think as Don said, set piece missed opportunities, discipline. I mean, to they made like you know they lose the line out to Devon Toner wins on a great steal with about twenty minutes to go, having forced Ryan Baird to knock it on, having won a scrum penalty, kicked the twenty two probably overcomplicate the line-out, but you lose it. And, you know, Leinster still have to exit, maybe have a line-out in Leinster half. Like, Jeremy Lachlan comes in and takes out Devin Toner in the air. Just little moments like that, that they just seem to lack composure or kind of real belief they're going to win and just panic. Is there a coaching problem then, Wes? I mean, you look at the, the coaching ticket and, and whatever about Van Grand, if you just, just re re put him aside for one second and look at Larkham, you know, and his experience and what he did as a player and his reputation when he came from Australia, albeit himself and Czech apart of the ways. And you look at Roundtree as well and the reputation that he comes with and his experience. And you're kind of saying to yourself, right, but they seem to have, you know, the guts of a decent squad of coaches there to get more out of the bunch of players that are there. So is there something amiss here? Are they just not gelling? What is it? Is it I think I think with, with, with Stephen Larkham, like like being honest, I did probably didn't know enough about him beyond the roles he held. Uh, like because he was a huge name and he was such a great player, I, I think people were kind of, you know, hugely enthusiastic about him coming. I, personally, I don't know. I haven't talked to enough players he's worked with to know the ins and outs of how he works. But there's a little bit of fear uh, involved in when you know that. You have to expand. Uh, yet, anytime you're under pressure, you you revert back to type. Um, in this case, go narrower, box kicking, etc. And I, I think following on from Donald's point about losing so many semi-finals, I, I think that fear, maybe fear is the wrong word, but I, I think you can see from the body language of both sets of players now when Munster are playing Leinster in these big games that, to me, Leinster look like they're eminently comfortable in their own skin and comfortable with the idea that they have Munster's number. And Munster seem to accept that to a large degree. And, and, and that, as a supporter, I think is what's unacceptable, is that you don't leave it all out there. You don't bring absolute aggression as, as a, your starting point. And I think, yeah, we know Leinster have certain advantages in terms of economically, population, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but... I've heard those lines given out so many times now at this point by so many different people that much like I think that the players are possibly accepting of their place in the pecking order, you, you start to wonder organisationally, are they accepting of their place? And, and, and I think equally, I think when they're all operating off a central system where, where the IRFU are, are coordinating things, I don't think the one, a one-size-fits-all approach is going to bring the best out of those provinces. I think it sounds a bit cheesy, but there has to be a monster solution to a monster problem. They're not going to ever surpass Leinster by trying to mimic what Leinster are doing. And I wonder, have those problems been identified? And if they've been identified, are they being tackled in an appropriate way? Um, I don't know. It, it seems fairly basic, Donald. Um, 
you know, we've spoken of this years ago. I don't know if this applies anymore, so you can tell me that it doesn't, and, and that's fine as well. You know, the tradition of Munster taking all their success from the strength of the club game, you know, the Limerick club game, Cork in particular as well, uh, and bringing the system. We now know the club game as it was 10, 15 years ago when Munster were excelling 2006, 2008. It's even a shadow of, of what it was then uh, and the relationship, I guess, with the provinces as well. Uh, whereas Leinster have obviously churned out this factory of academy players from the school system. Is it as simple and basic as that, that this is fundamentally where Munster's problem is now? Uh, there's a factor there, but you've got to learn from the mistakes of the past, and I don't think Munster have done that. Uh, there's no question club rugby isn't as strong as it was. Um, and, you know, the players aren't involved, uh, the bigger players aren't involved, let's say, with the clubs as often as they would have been in the past. But there's a whole, there's a separate debate around the way club rugby is organised in Munster. So don't get me going on that. There's a lot of right. shortcomings there, but that's, that's a debate for another day. I think if we take back a, a step or two from what Wes was talking about, it was identified a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the likes of, of, of uh, Jerry Flannery, Felix Jones, Mick O'Driscoll, uh, Brian Walsh, they had all been promoted from within, very good young coaches, uh, but that didn't work. Axel Lord Restum had been on top of that pyramid. He stepped back then when Razzy Erasmus came in. And I think the structure where you had Razzy Erasmus as director of rugby, and then you had Jacques Ninarber and Anthony Foley had been back on the coaching, doing what he does best, and they were going places. I mean, then, um, as I say, um, Jerry Flannery and Felix were promoted, um, maybe a little bit before time into the roles that they were. So it was identified that there was a coaching issue. So what did they do? To be fair to Munster, they went away, they recruited Roundtree and Larkham to come in and work beyond Van Graham. So that is a very experienced coaching ticket. Roundtree has been involved with the Lions. He had been involved with England, with Stuart Lancaster in 2015. Larkham has head coach experience with the Brumbies, who've always been the most innovative of the Australian um, uh, teams, uh, and assistant coach to check it with Australia. So they have that uh, coaching element there now. You can make all the excuses. Last year was awkward in that the World Cup was there. The players were missing for big tracks of the season. Um, but everybody was saying that the lockdown afforded the coaching ticket the opportunity of, of spending more time getting their message across. You go back to the game last weekend. Uh, don't tell Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster knew exactly what Munster were going to do before ever they arrived in the Aviva Stadium. Given that Larmer had experienced difficulties in the backfield the first day, then they knew that Munster were going to bombard them in the air. Why not be a little bit innovative and not put a kick up to Larmer for the first 10 minutes of the game? Let him suffer. Uh, like as, as Birch had mentioned, they had done their escorting to such a degree that no Munster player got anywhere near Jordan Larmer. He caught two balls in the opening three or four minutes of the game, so he was settled in, and we know he's a confidence player. And he has proved in the past, both for Leinster and indeed for Ireland. I go back to the game, you and I were there in, in Tokyo or in Yokohama when they played against Scotland in the World Cup, and uh, Larmer was full back there that day and had an outstanding game. Yeah. But I also go back to um, things that annoyed me from a coaching perspective. Like there, there, there's always a gamble when you have a 6 2 split on the bench. But Andrew Conway got injured, right? A winger. Rory Scandal comes in. The easiest thing put Rory Scandal on the wing. To get the way Munster were playing, it wasn't going to make that much of a difference. But they made three positional changes when they brought him in. JJ Hanrahan, who's 10, you're trying to give him confidence. They take him out of 10, they put him full back. They put Shane Daly, who's doing really well at fullback, they put him on the wing. And Rory Scandal, whose experience as an old half really was with Dolphin at All Ireland League level a number yeah. of years ago, he is then handed the reins. So that was one aspect, I must say, that annoyed me. The second thing, you go back, if you look, 13 uh, 3, they had a, a, a five metre line out uh, with six minutes left on the clock. No. Their line-out mall had failed to function on a number of occasions up to that. But again, they kicked to the corner. Watch where Chris Farrell is. He's standing in the front of the line-out. So, I mean, what message does that give to Leinster? They know there's nothing, there's no power play going to happen in midfield. Uh, those type of things I find really frustrating from a professional outfit. I mean, you've got to have more in your armory than that. Um, 
at one stage during the game, there was a, a positional change where Chris Farrell was out on the wing. I mean, the reason they kept the same back line together for the, uh, for the whole three games so that they could work on their understanding. And, and Farrell D'Alanda, that opening game, the battle himself and, and uh, D'Alanda had against Ring Rose and, and Robbie Henshaw mm-hmm. was outstanding. Um, but uh, they should have been allowed to develop that. I mean, I, I think you've got to throw caution to the wind. You lose nine semifinals in a row. You lose, I think, Munster have only won once in 16 games now in Dublin. So you've got to do something different. Uh, and they didn't. And I, that's what I find the most frustrating thing. Well, the book stops with Van Grand as an ad virtue. I mean, he's, he's the guy making the calls on the sideline. He's the guy reshuffling the back line to accommodate one player of three positional switches. Why Munster don't seem to be able to adapt to situations on the pitch, why they are reverting to type when Wes says they get under pressure, that they just go back into themselves. Does it not stop with him? Is this not all on him then? He's going to have to take a lot of the responsibility because, yeah, he is the figurehead and he is the, the head of that coaching staff. So um, I think, look, at he, I think he's a conservative coach by nature. Um, his, his pedigree is in, you know, playing. Uh, set piece and kicking orientated game he does tend to go back to type but I suppose it's the it's the whole coaching staff really I mean the examples that Donald has given there I wouldn't disagree with them and, and but you know but you have to give Johan some credit some you have to believe that Johan gives you know Larkham some power as well over backline strike plays um, you know tactical substitutions in, in, a, in the back line that, that they have those meetings beforehand they agree on us and you know and you look at Australia under Larkham sorry to cut across Australia under Larkham when he was when he was assistant to Michael Checkett had some of the most brilliant and innovative strike plays in fact you know you can make a point that like bar their back row they were getting smashed up front it was their back line and the um, I guess ability to mix things up and keep teams guessing that actually kept Australia winning matches when they had no right to. And, and surely Larkham had to be a big factor in that. Yeah, interestingly, the rumour is the reason him and Cheka fell out was over was over style of play. And it was actually that Larkham wanted to play a much more conservative style of play. Really? Uh, so I don't remember, but Cheka, the reason Australia fell, fell on their sword a little bit in the World Cup was not having a kicking game and this relentless possession, possession, possession. And Actually, I'm not sure. I'm not saying sure that Larkin wasn't, you know, the the genius behind those strike plays. But definitely, from what I see, he's he's a conservative coach, more conservative coach than he was as a player. Um, and that's that's the that's the feedback I I got from players he coached in the Brumbies was uh, very methodical in terms of areas of the field to play, etc. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's um, every coach has their own way of doing it. So I think for us to believe that Larkin was is the kind of attacking mindset coach that he was as a player. Yeah. There's not really evidence of that in the Brumbies on Australia based on what the clash was with Cheka. You know what I mean? They fell out over over a tactical um, difference of opinions. But okay. having said that, is he able to coach a back line to attack? I'm sure, he, I'm sure he is well capable of that and the players speak very highly of him. I think the most interesting for me is two things. I think, you know, Wesley, your point around the organisation for sure, the organisation in Munster have got things wrong, okay, um, and particularly around pathways, club game, etc. There's definitely question marks around that. I think to give them credit, Munster have only lost probably one player they wanted to keep. That was Zebo, right? And that became a, an RFU domestic contract. I think in general they managed to hold on to the players, and they have backed the team by giving them Razi, Nino Bar. And to a certain extent, uh, Roundtree and Larkham, I mean, you know, they are top-end coaches with very full CVs. Johan had a very good CV as well. So I think maybe when money was tight, um, they didn't, I suppose, hamper the team by not investing in them. Uh, Afterwards, you can talk around strategic decisions and things like that, but I think they have given them the best they maybe can give them in terms of support and and staff for for the senior team. The question mark, I would say, is is around, I suppose, your your depth chart and your roster and your squad. I think what you have to criticise them for is not blooding some of those talented players. So for years, the excuse was, oh, there's nothing in our academy. I actually disagree now. I think there's a, a current crop of five yeah. or six really interesting 
profile. So Crowley um, has looked, Crowley, Flannery, and Healy look like they all have individual potential. You know, the feedback I heard is that Crowley's a standout um, player there. You know, Casey, if Casey was in Leinster, would he have played 25 Pro 14 games by now? All right, he definitely would have played 15 or 16. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many had some answer. I don't know if it's a double figures. Um, Ahern is a, is a, is a really yeah. interesting profile. Hodden is a really interesting profile. Jack O'Sullivan's a really interesting profile. We saw Alex Wooden play for Connor two weeks ago and he looked, he, you know, he looked a useful player. I know he's gone alone, but there's, there is a group of lads there who have some potential. And I think the next four months, we don't know what the co- competition structure is for October, November, December. There's rumours of a Celtic Cup. But I would love to see Munster actually try and find new talent from within. And look, the reality is, if those lads aren't good enough to play Pro 14, um, it, like uh, there's something wrong. I think they are. And they should be good enough to go into their Munster team and still win Pro 14 games with young players in there. And that's going to give you more options because I think, you know, Wesley spoke about, the, there's too many guys in that squad at the moment who've had lots of chances who haven't been able to get the job done at, at semi-final level. So at some stage you have to cut, um, you know, cut that uh, cord and look to find new players. Like they did with Snyman and Lande. They went out and spent big money on them and, you know, they were right to, but probably they need three or four more to come through internally, I would say. Um, I don't know what Donald thinks or, or Wesley or, or, or Mike thinks that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, look, I know a lot of those players up front. Uh, I've seen a lot of them in club rugby. Uh, Hugh, you and I, we've done all the under-20 matches uh, in the Six Nations of the last two or three years. So we've seen them play against their counterparts in England and France. The likes of Ahern, Crowley, Healy, uh, uh, John Hodman, oh, these guys. Yeah. Um, and there's no question, there's outstanding talent there. Um, I go back to, uh, I know we'd probably be talking about Ulster and Leinster, but look, Look what, to be fair, Dan McFarland. Uh, I've had a huge amount of time for Dan McFarland. You could see the frustration in his face after Ulster's two games, the two warm-up games prior to the semi-final against Edinburgh. But he had no hesitation. I mean, Marty Moore looked way off the pace, I thought, in some of the games that he played. Um, But McFarland, in a semi-final, away to Edinburgh, he promotes Eric O'Sullivan and Tom O'Toole off the bench, two starting props. Now, that sent a message to their whole team. He wasn't happy. Um, uh, now, you know, not saying that the fault in the earlier games were strictly down to Jack McGrath and Marty Moore, but it put everyone on notice. And when Ulster were under severe pressure, 12 points down on two occasions in that semi-final, the bench made a massive impact. So you had seasoned internationals, the Jack McGrath, a, a, a lion, uh, mm. coming in off the bench with something to prove. But the key for me is that McFarland had the trust in those two young props to put them out there to start the semi-final in the first place. That trust doesn't seem to be within Munster at the moment. And again, uh, I agree. In terms, the Pro 14 season is uh, it's all over the place at the moment. There's rumours that the four South African franchises could be coming in in the new year. So you just don't know what's, what's going to happen. So if ever there was a case of giving some of those younger players that, that Birch and uh, Ways have mentioned, now is the time. For me, Tom Ahern, geez, this guy has it. Like, he's an outstanding athlete. He has passed every test that we've seen grow up. I saw Ryan Baird play for Trinity against Cork Khan in the all Ireland League in College Park. Uh, the se- last year, the, the season before last. He was a mm. standout figure. Look how far he's come in 12 months. In my view, Tom O'Hearn could make that same rapid progress. But he won't do it if he's left at home or he's left outside the stadium in the bus. Uh, you've got to give him a chance. Absolutely. And Wes, this is the thing. I, you know, I think the common theme here that the lads have arrived upon is that the coaches are being too conservative. And like, I, it kills me to say it. Stephen Larkin was a player who was one of my favourite of all time. I, I, I'm really struggling with the fact now that he's a conservative. If that bears out to be true, which I, I understand it is, I, I really struggle the, with the that. Common, the common theme, Hugh, really, is that we all want to see a bit of bravery and a bit of creativity at multiple levels. At the first team, in terms of like, they're incapable of generating quick ball, it seems. People, some people blame carriers for that. 
some people blame clear outs. Like, there's never even a starter play, as you were talking about, just to speed things up a bit and attack off second phase. They then need to be brave with these young players. Um, all right, Kil- Kilcoyne's name and Carberry, Klein come back, that strengthened things. But they need them to come back and another three or four to put their hand up. All the guys Bertrand Donal mentioned, and a couple more I could think of, like Jonathan Wren, like Sean French, Keenan Knox, Roman Salanoa, all these guys. And then no one would like the all Ireland League to be back strong and eight, eight and 9,000 people going to matches every week, more than myself or Donal would. And I'd love to see the B&I Cup done away with and all the contracted players go back and play club rugby every week. But let's be honest, we've been talking about this for 20 years. It's not going to happen. There's no use yeah. bemoaning it. So go out and find this, the, what your AIL for this generation is. If the AIL was the, the, the building block of the early 2000s, go out and find what it is now. Is that recruiting... Uh, Irish qualified players from other parts of the world and, and, and turning them to rugby from other sports? Is that looking at GA players closer to home? Is that getting tag rugby played as part of the P syllabus in every primary school in Munster and funneling the best players into clubs when they're teenagers? I don't know, but you need to go and explore it. So it's a, it's a, it's a provincial issue then that doesn't, that doesn't end with the coach, uh, Donald. This, go, this goes right to the heart of Munster organisation and who are making the Chief decisions on behalf of Munster Rugby. That's where the book stops here. It's not. It's not yeah, a coach. I that, right yeah, no, that's true. And uh, you know, Birch has already highlighted. To be fair, the Munster Professional Board, they haven't been found wanting in terms of coming up with the money to buy the best players and the best coaches. Um, the worry that I have is the, the 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 layer underneath that. As I mentioned already, the the way club rugby is run here in Munster. Uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Leinster can, uh, they can almost get away with the fact that, um, you know, they don't need club rugby. They have so much talent coming out of the schools year on year. A lot of their academy players completely bypass the club system. That mm. works for them. Munster need a different model. I've been preaching this for years, but uh, you look at, uh, again, I, I wrote an article, I'd say it must be three or four years ago now, as where are all the Limerick forwards gone? I got lacerated, of course, from all my friends in Limerick. Um, <laughs> including but, Wesner. Know, if, <laughs> including, well, I think he kind of silently agreed with me, but every Munster team that I played with over a 10, 12-year period, half of the pack were made up of fellas from Shannon, Young Munster's Gary Owen. Dave Kilcoyne has been the only regular starting forward for Munster for the past four years. There's something going uh, going on there. It's almost like cannibalism. There's too many clubs there now. You had junior clubs like Richmond, Thoman, St. Mary's years ago. They were feeder clubs to the likes of Gary Owen, Shannon, Young Monsters. Uh, but they're all senior clubs in their own right now. So, I mean, it's, it's almost a race to the bottom. And uh, it, it's, a real, it's a big concern for me because you need that traditional monster element, uh, that DNA that's part and parcel of every successful monster team. Um, but I just worry that that's been diluted over a period of time. And look, the professional game, the game moves on, but there are certain things, um, you know, was it, uh, I, I was reading some like coaches, like a unity of purpose, fellas, uh, you know, having a strong identity with who they play for. They're things that professional coaches and organizations all over the world would give their right hand to have naturally. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's something that's just, uh, there's a missing ingredient within Munster at the moment. Um, and it's not going to change overnight, no matter who you buy. Okay. Um, I, we should mention Ulster, um, you know, and Ian Madigan, Bernard, because it was some kick to win it. Um, but just in the grand scheme of this weekend, I guess, you know, the performance, did you see anything of Ulster's win against Edinburgh, Titan all as it was, that suggests that they can trouble Leinster this weekend? And I'm not being facetious here, but like on paper and an all-known form, Leinster are going to win this game. Look, I think if you think back to pre-lockdown, Ulster were looking like they were serious contenders with, with to go head to head with any team they have. They might not have the depth Leinster have, but they have a very um, strong team. And the advantage they have is that they play more than Munster. They're used to playing, and I think to beat Leinster, you have to take risks. Um, and I think while they were in, probably worried about their form the first two rounds, and the first half against Edinburgh was was also poor. 
that last 20 minutes will give them massive confidence. And they'll feel they've just, they've just found their mojo. As Donald said, the bench coming on. I mean, that's great for, for, for Team Spirit. But also, you need a good bench against Leinster. You, you know, the first choice 15 aren't going to going to win it. Um, I think Stockdale end back up in the wing. You know, Little is in form. Have Kutsia and McCluskey who are, you know, big games. And they use them for everything, you know. Um, and they are capable of, of having big games, getting their hands free and, and putting someone else away. So, look, at on form, on form uh, um, Leinster are, are hot favourites. But I, I do think Ulster can make a contest of it. And I went back and looked at, trying to find out what Dan would do for the final. Um, and realistically, in a lot of these Pro 14 games, Ulster, they're usually strong at home. Leinster send a weaker team. And likewise, Ulster have sent really poor teams to the RDS over the last couple of years. So it's hard to see what Dan thinks is the right tactics to beat Leinster. So I went back and looked at that game last March in the Viva, in the quarterfinal of the Champions Cup, where I think they lost by, by two or three points. And... Um, they they played, you know, they played and, and uh, they put a lot of pressure on Leinster's kicking game. Gary Ringrose got blocked down for a try for, for Treadwell. Um, you remember Stockdale, unfortunately, knocked the, or dropped the ball over the line, but it was from a really positive play. And their forward yeah. runners, they, they played really hard inside the third defender. So Cooney was having a little, a little pick and go himself and he had likes of Kutsia and um, Treadwell and... and um, Eric O'Sullivan coming hard off his shoulder at that second defender from Leinster, whereas most teams try and run at the third or fourth defender and open up the blind side. So they did vary their game and it troubled Leinster. Now, obviously, Leinster will also look back at that. And um, But I think Ulster have four or five game breakers that you know could could definitely have an impact on the game and challenge them. You have to admire Dan McFarland, Donald, for, for turning Ulster's um, form it hasn't been a complete U-turn but certainly the steady levels of progression in a short space of time whereas three weeks ago they looked really disjointed and, and badly organised and, and as Bernard said the last 20 minutes against Edinburgh you could see a big improvement Yeah look I have huge time for Dan McFarlane I don't know the guy I've never spoken to him but you know he took over a, a province in turmoil really when he came in uh, he's made a, a massive turnaround I think psychologically he's worked on the small things fighting for every inch just building a, a philosophy within the group where they play for each other. And, you know, I think going back to that game, that quarterfinal, this Ulster group know that they were within touching distance of beating Leinster in a really high-profile tournament only six months ago. So, therefore, yeah. they, they know they have the armory to do it if everything works in their favour. But, again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on two things, or certainly one thing that Birch mentioned there. The two key men for Ulster are McCluskey and Kutsia. They are their go-to men, the fellows who get them over the line. Now, again, a bit like uh, Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster knowing exactly what Munster were going to do in terms of the kick chase and the pressure on the breakdown, Leinster will be prepared for that. We know that Will Connors was brought in, the chop tackle, the choke tackle that Johnny Sexton was involved in, in, in De Allende. They will target those two guys. So I think if Ulster want to win this one, They've got to find a way to almost use those guys as decoys or to play around them or to use them as a mechanism by which to suck in Leinster defenders and create something else off that. They're not going to beat Leinster by doing the same things that they normally do. And this is where the whole innovation and coaching comes into it for me. They've got to produce something different and uh, play in a way that Leinster aren't expecting. In my view, that's the only way that they can beat Leinster. Um, but look, no team is unbeatable. What Leinster have achieved is phenomenal. I mean, they, they win on Saturday. That's a whole campaign in the Pro, Pro 14 without losing a game, despite the fact that they've probably played about 50 different players. So um, if Ulster win, they're going to have to just produce something slightly different, something that yeah. Leinster won't expect. You, Rez, you, give us a prediction there. Mick, do you want to come in there? Sorry. Yeah, no, just a story in the Independent this morning that maybe Sexton won't play um, and they're holding him back for, for Saracens because it would be three weeks in a row that he would play, albeit he's coming off the back of a big break. But, mm. I mean, I would maybe think that that could be a bit of a source of inspiration for Ulster if, if they're going to, if Leinster are practically saying we don't need our, our, our best player to, to play against you to beat you. So I don't know mm. if it could backfire if it comes true, but I mean, Ulster will need everything to go go further. 
uh, and, and a bit extra. Yeah, I think you, Ross, you Ross Byrne will play, but he's, I don't know how many games Johnny's played in the Pro 14, maybe five or six. So I think Ross Byrne is a, is a quality player in his own right. He actually, ironically, played in that match in Aviv and kicked the winning penalty at the end um, against Ulster. But I, I think Lancer will be very strong, but they will have to change the team a little bit. They'll have to bring in three or four guys to freshen it up. I think, just going back to the Cotilla one, there's definitely a temptation to play Will Connors to, to man-mark him as such. But I think they need him to do that to Billy Vunapola next week. So um, whether he goes back-to-back, -back, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. But uh, yeah, Leinster will be strong, but they, they may... They, I don't think they'll have the same 23 to play against Saracens next week. Yeah, Wes, imagine the scenario, like, you know, with Leinster, if all things been equal, everyone's back pitch, and you have, say, Dan Levy starting at seven, and he's chopping down opposition players by the knee, left, right and centre. He runs like a lunatic for 50 minutes and then they bring this fellow Connors off the bench to do it for the last half an hour. I mean, potentially they have two of the best chop tackler sevens players in Europe right now, you know, depending on your point of view on that. You probably have another Scotland. couple we don't even know about yet. They're ready to spring shortly as well, but mm. like they're... To me, like I didn't think Leinster were brilliant the last night against Munster either. Um, they didn't no, they need weren't. to be, but what they, what they did have that you could see, and we've seen it lots now, is one is their composure and their ability to play at the pace they want to play at is just excellent, the, the confidence they have in that. And and two, it's just uh, like to use the kind of jargon of the game, but it's their ability to kind of problem solve from week to week. You know, the, the breakdown was a problem the first day against Munster. Their back three dealing with the aerial game is a bit of a problem. That becomes... They don't just negate that problem. They, they turn that into a strength in a matter of weeks. And I think that's a mark of really good coach and a really focused group. And it's the luxury of having really good players across the board. Um, the, the flip side for Ulster is McFarland seems to be a kind of talismanic figure. Like, for better or worse, he seems to have a big personality. And the group seems to be, at the minute, buying into... You know, when you hear this this fight for every inch stuff and things like that, when you lose, that sounds like rubbish. But all that it takes for it to be valid is for people to believe in it. And so, sometimes in a tournament, you know, we've seen it in the Pro 14 with, with Scarlet particularly and Glasgow as well. You can kind of just get on a run of momentum. And it just felt like where they, they'd been so poor the first couple of games back and they looked like Edinburgh were going to run away with it at times early in the game last week. And... All of a sudden, it turned, and you'd have to think they take huge belief out of that. They have nothing to lose. Maybe Leinster, they're going to have to lose a little bit of focus somewhere at some point. So, I don't think it's impossible that Ulster can go and win this game. I mean, nine, will they, eight times out of ten do Leinster win it? Yeah. But hmm. I, I definitely give Ulster a, a puncher's chance. Yeah. Just as, before as, we leave, Tommy, yeah. sorry, you as Tommy Kiernan famously said one time, every three or four times you play against Australia, you beat them nine times out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit like just, that. Just before we leave it, uh, Donald, you know the Guaguares in Argentina are, are virtually kaput now, right? I don't know who's what they're going to do for Argentina. Who's that you're talking about there? The Jaguares, then. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. over there. You, Jesus Christ. You can't, you can't educate those young monster lads at all. Um, <laughs> do, do, if, if, you were, if, you were, if you were looking for a, a bit of a, a, a shortstop solution for Munster's problem at the moment, would you not get the check one out and sign a few Argentinians and bring them down to, to Munster and maybe plug the hole for next season and give them a chance here? What do you reckon? We spent the last hour talking about promoting young fellas. Do you listen to us discussed it all on this podcast? <laughs> on that bombshell, on that bombshell, we'll leave it for this week. My thanks to Donald, uh, to Mick, to Bernard and to Wes. We're back next week. Enjoy the Pro 14 final and we'll talk about it all again same time next week.